All right, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and this will be our Sermon of the Week. I had to get outside today instead of in front of the whiteboard. I want to get in front of the whiteboard here soon, but it's just so beautiful outside. I had to come out early in the morning because it's been getting hot here. But this will be our Sermon of the Week, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Not exactly the sermon that I would have planned, but because of the course of events and things we went through lately, this is the, the, the illustration that the Lord gave me of something that I thought, wow, what an illustration. So I thought, man, I, I guess I have to preach this. Um, we kind of had a little bit of a disaster, if you will, and I'll get to that here in a minute. But uh, last week we looked at sailing, and I talked about the fundamentals of sailing, the class that I took for three days, things like that. And the spiritual lessons that I took from that, as the Lord showed me physically a lot of the things about sailing, I said, wow, that kind of lines up with the Bible and corresponds with the Bible. Well, we actually got to go out and do some sailing, and uh, the Lord taught me some more stuff. So I'd like to share that with you today. I hope people aren't like, oh no, he's going to talk about sailing again. Well, before we get started, I got to talk about what would you call it? We had a little bit of a, a boating disaster. I guess you could say. And I don't want to make it out sound like it was more than it was, but I also, well, it, it could have been really bad. So I'll just tell you what happened and then get into the message because it all ties in with the message that I wanted to do this week. I wanted to talk about salvation this week, but with everything that happened, it, it just, it kind of just ties in together. So let me tell you the, the sermon title here, and then we'll get this all together. The title of this week's sermon is, Sailing Reminds Me of Salvation. Sailing Reminds Me of Salvation. As I was out there in the boat sailing, I, I just kept thinking about, oh wow this, oh wow that, well, and, and everything I do in this life, I'm praying, I'm putting the Lord first, or trying to, and, and it just seems like the Lord teaches you every day something new, doesn't He? As you read your Bible, as you live and you do things, you can learn and tie everything in in the physical into something spiritual. And so we're out sailing and I'm thinking about sailing reminds me of salvation. And then something happened and it was just like, wow, what a perfect illustration of salvation because I needed to be saved physically out in the boat. You say, what, what happened, Brother Breaker? Well, out here in this bay, this is Escambia Bay, Oh, it's only about four or five miles over there to the boat launch. So we brought the boat over here, and then going back, the boat began to take on water. And the boat began to what we call list, and it listed this way and listed that way. And I could tell, oh my, something's happening. Some water was beginning to come in. And now this boat's not supposed to sink. It's full of foam, so I wasn't scared to the sense that, oh no, we're going to the bottom, but I knew something was not right. And it began to go so far to one side and so far to the other side. And this is supposed to be a self-riding boat. If it turns over, then it comes straight back up. Well, it wasn't coming back. It was hanging over on one side or the other. All of a sudden, all the water went to the back. And we're, um, we're going and, well, it kept getting lower and lower and lower. The engine stopped. I don't know if it was because the water in the cabin affected the electrical or what but we're out there in the middle of the bay my phone went underwater but Laura's phone we were able to keep out of the water we were able to call 911 and we were rescued <laughs> it was literally a water rescue and we had to be rescued um, I did not know that the fire department would would come out I didn't know that but there were two different boats and uh, one was from our county fire department. I guess the other was, I forget where they said, maybe it was the other county across the bay. But we had to be rescued because our boat was going down in the water. And um, that was kind of a not fun thing to go through, <laughs> to be honest with you. Can't say that I enjoyed it. More than anything though, disappointed. Just very disappointed because I, I didn't, I didn't want to go through that. But sometimes the Lord allows things to happen. and. Wow, it, it just all kind of ties into the message that I wanted to preach this week. So maybe the Lord allowed that to happen in order to bring this message. And uh, maybe somebody will get saved. I hope so. I hope so. So I want to say sailing reminds me of salvation. Now, uh, like I said, we had our life preservers on. I didn't really feel scared. 
I knew that they would come. I, I just, I knew that somebody would have to find us. And if anything, worst case scenario, we would float in. But we had to leave the boat there overnight. And then the next day they came out and they, they called it salvaging it. And they salvaged it and brought it back. And now we're waiting on the insurance to figure out why that happened and all that good stuff. But it was quite interesting to go through that ordeal. Um, I don't want it to sound worse than it was, really. But there are sharks out there. You know, had we had to end up in the water, there was one time when the boat was this high up and a little gust of wind blew, and I thought, oh no, we're going over all the way. But luckily we didn't, but I was definitely standing up on the side of the boat at one time. So like I said, I don't want it to sound like it's too horrible of a thing, but it was an inconvenience to say the very least. And yeah, I guess you could say they did save our lives because had we gone in the water, we might have been eaten by sharks. You never know. But what a great illustration of salvation. We got rescued. Amen. And these folks came out and rescued us. Well, when you get saved, what happens? Well, the Lord rescues you. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about sailing reminds me of salvation. And I just got a couple verses. Let's start off with 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verse 25. 2 Corinthians 11, 25. Paul says, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. <laughs> so this isn't anything new that's ever happened to people. Paul went through this a couple times. Uh, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Well, at least we weren't out there for a day and a half. We were out there just for, was it even an hour or two? In journeys oft, verse 26, in perils of water. I guess you could say that's what we were in. We were in a peril in water in which the ship began to list. And I knew, uh, according to the brochure, that the, that the boat can't sink all the way to the bottom. With the flotation, it only sink maybe halfway. So I knew, well, at least we can hold on to the boat until we're saved. But it certainly was a peril. Boats aren't supposed to do that, okay? So we were in perils of water. And he continues there, and the Apostle Paul continues telling you all the things that he went through. Perils of this, perils of that, perils of this, perils, peril. Peril, what is peril? In Spanish, it's peligro, danger. Apostle Paul went through a lot of dangerous things in his life. And uh, wow, so I, I'm beginning to identify a little bit with Paul. <laughs> Some of the things that Paul went through. I was a missionary as Paul was a missionary. Actually, I was a single missionary as Paul was a single missionary. I got, I got married later. So it was an interesting experience to say the least. But I want to talk about today how sailing reminds me of salvation. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, if you put somebody in a sailboat who's never sailed before, and took them out in the middle of the ocean and said, okay, it's all yours, bye, and you leave, I seriously doubt that that person would know how to sail. Because before you can sail, you have to know something. You have to learn. This line is called this. This over here is called that. Uh, this is the halyard. This is the boom. This is the mast. This is the mainsail. Before you can sail, you have to know something. Well, when it comes to salvation, before you can be saved, you have to know something. Salvation is knowing something. I believe in what I call a no-so salvation. I believe that when you're saved, you'll know you're saved. But I also believe that before you can get saved, you have to know something. Someone has to come and share the gospel with you and show you what the Bible says about how to be saved. You know, there's people out there to say, well, if you want to be saved, you just say, oh, God, save me, and you're saved. They say, you don't have to know anything to get saved. Just say, oh, God, save me. And I look at that and I go, well, then why the gospel then? Why do we preach the gospel? If that's true, then forget the gospel. Just go tell everybody, ask God to save you. But that, that's not how you're saved. It's not the asking that saves you. It's knowing something first and then believing that with your whole heart. So salvation is something you need to know. Same thing with sailing. Like I say, you can't just put a guy on a sailboat and go, okay, you're on your own. Have a nice day. He's going to look at there and go, well, which, which, uh, which line, not rope, there's no ropes on a boat, which line do I pull? <laughs> and that's a good question. So you have to be trained. You have to learn. You have to know something before you can sail. Same thing with salvation. I think it's interesting. On the boat, there's some things called the sheets. Be familiar with the sheets. <laughs> well, we have a Bible here. And what's all these pages? They're different sheets. 
different pages. And you need to go through the pages of the Bible. You need to pour through. You need to learn what the Bible says. And then as you go through these sheets, you read the words, and then you know what God said. Now this is how you're saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, Who will have all men to be saved. God wants all men saved. God wants everybody to come to salvation. How can you be saved? Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So there's a knowledge. There is something you need to know in order to get saved. And that is the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. And uh, like I said, there's some people out there who claim to be preachers that are not preaching the gospel. And that's sad. And then there's others out there that claim to be missionaries or pastors or evangelists, and they preach what I call a bloodless gospel. And they don't ever talk about the blood of Jesus. I think you need to know the gospel. I think you need to know the importance of the blood. And I think you need to know these things in order to understand and then believe. That's what Jesus said. I believe it was in Matthew 13, 15, if I remember correctly. Jesus said that you have to hear and understand and then be converted. So before conversion, before salvation, there must be a hearing. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You've got to hear something. Then you've got to know what it is. Then you believe. And that's when you're saved. So the knowledge of the truth. The Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Look what it says. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. What is to believe in vain? Well, vain is like self, selfishness. You know, If you're believing in yourself or something you do, then you haven't believed at all. You're trusting in yourself. And you're believing in vanity in yourself instead of that. Or maybe it's talking about you've believed just in the head but not from the heart. It's one thing to know something in the head. It's another thing from the heart. And salvation is a heart belief. But according to the Bible, you've got to know something. And what is it you've got to know? You've got to know the gospel. Why? Because it says right here, by which also you are saved. You're saved through the gospel. So preaching of the gospel must come first. And someone must know the gospel in order to be saved. I just get so sick and tired of hearing these people that claim to be Christians run around saying, you don't need to know the gospel, you don't need to know anything, don't listen to that breaker fella. Salvation is one verse, Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, you just tell somebody, hey, I asked Jesus to save you, and you say, oh God, save me, and you're saved. You don't need to know anything. I'm like, so I could take you out in the middle and put you in a sailboat and then say bye and leave, and you don't know anything, but you'll be sailing across the bay by yourself? No, there's, there's some teaching. There's some knowledge. In, you've got to know something before you can sail. Same thing with salvation. You've got to know something before you can get saved. What do you need to know? Well, here's the gospel, verse 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So Paul saved, because he received it. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you need to know that. You need to know that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. You need to understand that. But is that all? Uh, some people have been contacting me and saying, Brother Breaker, there's this discussion going on on the internet about how much do you need to know to get saved. Well, first of all, you need to know something. So all these pastors out there that say, you don't need to know anything to get saved, they are wrong. Okay, that's heresy. You do need to know something. You need to know the gospel. But then other people say, well, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 enough? If I just believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, am I saved? And they say saved is the death, burial, resurrection. Well, there's this famous preacher out there. I won't name his name. You probably know who it is. And years ago, he said this. And he is so wrong when he said this. But years ago, he says, um, yeah, it's not important, the blood of Jesus. What's, what saves us is the death. And when he said that, I thought, that man's a preacher? That man stands in a pulpit and tries to instruct and teach people? I said, that's got to be one of the dumbest statements ever made in the history of the world. What does the Bible teach? All right, let's go back to the Old Testament first, and then let's go to the New Testament, because New Testament salvation is shadowed in the Old Testament. There's many types of our salvation in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, I believe it's Leviticus 4, when you sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice. And the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and it's what makes an atonement. 
And I believe it's Leviticus 4, if a man sinned through ignorance, he's to bring a lamb, he's to cut the throat, and then the priest comes and, and takes the blood and offers the blood up for an atonement for his sins. And it's through the offering of the shedding of blood that the man finds forgiveness. And it says in the passage, and it shall be forgiven him. So forgiveness of sins through the blood atonement, through the shedding of blood. Well, Paul tells us that clearly in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So if that's what they knew under the Old Testament is, hey, when I sin, I need to have shed blood. Do you think they were saying, and it's just the death that saves you? So I could have taken a little lamb and just said, okay, God, accept this for my sins and, and strangled the little thing to death. And then said, okay, he's dead. Now I'm forgiven by the death. No. That goes against the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament, it said you had to shed the blood. So through the dying and shedding of the blood, then after it was offered, do you get forgiveness. So that's the Old Testament type of New Testament salvation. New Testament salvation is not the blood of an animal. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Remission is forgiveness of sins. So Jesus shows up and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. So Jesus shed his blood. And that's why we have Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. And here's another discussion. There's people who say, well, you don't need to know anything about the blood of Jesus to get saved. And you look at that and you go, that's like... What? <laughs> That's like saying a guy under the Old Testament didn't have to know anything about shedding of blood. Why, if he sinned, he just says, Oh God, please forgive me my sin. Amen. And then he's forgiven? No, the law said, you have to know, in the Old Testament, they knew their law, that when you sinned, you brought a sacrifice, and when that blood was shed and offered, then you were forgiven. Type of salvation today. Jesus Christ shows up, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And it's that blood that Jesus shed that saves us. But this famous preacher says, no, no, it's just the death. And I'm thinking to myself, so, so remember when Jesus comes out to the boat and the disciples are on that boat and they're thinking, oh, we're going to sink, we're going to sink, you know, kind of went through what I was going through. <laughs> and Jesus came and, and, and saved them. Are you telling me if Jesus would have died right there, if he would have drowned, are you telling me that death right there would have saved me? In all of our hymn books, we would have Jesus drowned, Jesus drowned, and we all be rejoicing on the death of Christ and how he died by drowning for our sins and stuff like that. No, no, all throughout the hymn book, it's all about the blood. It's all about he died, but the dying is him shedding his blood. So you see, you can't say salvation is just the death of Jesus. How did he die? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says how that Christ died for our sins. The means or the method in which Jesus died is so important. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 says this. And this is the debate that people are debating now. A lot of people have been emailing me and saying, Brother Breaker, please talk about this. They're saying, oh, a lot of people are running around just saying 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and they're leaving out Romans 3, 25. Well, I don't want to leave out Romans 3.25. I believe in a blood-stained gospel. I don't want to preach a blood-less gospel. If you get a chance, go to YouTube, look up my video entitled The Blood-Less Gospel. And I'll explain to you what the bloodless gospel is because I want you to have the blood-stained gospel. But I was saved on Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His what? Does it say death? <laughs> It says, through faith in his blood. So Paul is telling us that, yes, Jesus died, and the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But it's not just the fact that he died. What if Jesus would have died in his sleep? Um, would we be saved? Would we be singing hymns today? Jesus died in his sleep for my sins. No. It's the way that he died. And the Bible says that salvation is through faith in his blood. So if salvation is through just believing in his death, why is there a verse in the Bible that says through faith in his blood? See, there's a lot of folks out there that, that say, no, no, I believe you've got to know something to get saved, but the something that I say you have to know doesn't include the blood. And I look at that and I say, well, then I, I don't think that that's the right gospel. You have a bloodless gospel. You're leaving out the blood of Jesus. Let's remember Romans 3.25, okay? Romans 3.25 is key through faith in his blood. And I've told you this before, but I remember as a younger um, Christian, I got saved when I was 18 years old, 
going to different churches and hearing the pastors and preachers say, through faith in his blood, through faith in his blood. But as the years went on, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later, I'm about to celebrate my 29th spiritual birthday, amen, um, I'm hearing pastors say less and less through faith in his blood. Why are they not preaching Romans 3.25 when they clearly used to? Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of scary. So let's don't forget the blood of Jesus, okay? I just wanted to throw that out there and put that here into the sermon. Sailing reminds me of salvation. There's something you need to know before you can sail. you got to learn something. It's one of the reasons I took the class, to learn more. And when it comes to salvation, there's something you got to know before you can be saved. And what better thing to teach someone than the blood of Christ? Because that's not just the mechanics of salvation, his shedding his blood. According to Romans 3.25, that's the object of our faith. And our faith is supposed to be in the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation. So sailing reminds me of salvation because you got to know something. Second thing I want to say is sailing reminds me of salvation because you got to trust in something. And when you're out there sailing, you've got cleats, you've got hitches, you've got all these different things, and you trust your equipment in hoping that it works, you know? And so there's some trust involved while you're sailing. But you're also, many sailors say, well, I'm trusting in myself, and I'm trusting in my knowing what I'm doing. But what happens when everything fails, like it did for me? You try to do everything you can right, and then it just gets worse and worse and worse, and you start to sink. What, what do you, I mean, you've done everything you could. Who do you trust now? <laughs> well, we're out there in the middle of the water, and my only thought was, all I know to do is dee, 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 911, you know? And I knew that this is a small bay. It's not like I'm in the middle of the ocean. You could see the other side. I was thinking to myself, well, I trust that they'll be able to send somebody out to save us. So there was trust there, and I trusted. Salvation is trust. You know what trust is? Trust is believing, and trust is faith. Trusting and relying on someone else to save you. You know what I realized when we started to go down? Oh, well, maybe, just maybe, we might make it. Ooh, fingers crossed. You know, that's how a lot of people are in salvation. I don't know if I'm saved or not, but whoo, I hope so. I, maybe I'll make it. That's not salvation. And we're going along, and I'm thinking, oh, it's possible to talk, and then boom, the engine cuts out. And then we're going one side, then we're going the other, then we're going down more, going down more. And I said, okay, I can't save myself. <laughs> no matter what I do, we got to get some help. So I realize I need to be saved. And that's part of salvation. Do you realize you're lost? And a lot of people run around and say, hey, are you saved? Hey, man, are you saved? Are you saved, man? Hey, are you saved? And that's a good question because we care about people. We want to see them saved. But you know what a better question is? Hey, when did you get lost? When did you realize that you couldn't get to heaven based upon your works? When did you realize that you're in a mess and you can't save yourself? <laughs> that salvation is coming to that point and then trusting or relying on someone else to save you. And that someone else, of course, is Jesus Christ. We go to Titus chapter 3. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We got to a situation where we could not save ourselves. So our only hope was we got to trust somebody else to come out and get us. And they got us, and they got us on the boat. And then we turned around, and, and these two guys grab Laura as she's getting into the boat, and I grab her. And, and I just looked at it as a perfect illustration of Jesus' hand comes out and grabs us when we're saved, when we trust in Him. You see, salvation isn't just saying, oh God, save me. You can do that without faith. You can do that without knowledge. You can say, God, save me, and not know the gospel. Are you saved? Or you can um, say, oh God, please save me. Are you saved because you asked? What if you're not trusting in Jesus? There's some faith. And the Bible teaches that salvation is through faith, through trusting. Titus chapter three and verse five, look like what it says. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing the whole deal. So how are we saved? Not by our works. You see, we could have been out there bailing. We could have been out there trying to do this and trying to do that and say, No, nah, we're not going to seek anybody to come save us. We're going to do it ourselves. And we could have died. We had to give up and realize, 
I can't save myself. I, I need help. And that's when you come to the point of, okay, now what? Well, now you no longer trust in yourself. Now you say, I've got to trust in somebody else. And that salvation is through Jesus. He saves us by faith, not by our works. 2 Timothy 1.9 is another a great verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who hath saved us and called us with his holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So do you understand that? There's a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians. And you say, well, what's your testimony? Tell me about it. How did you get saved? And they say, well, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this. Thank you very much. And it becomes very clear that what they're saying is, and I think I deserve heaven based upon what I do. And they're still trying to save themselves, thinking they'll get to heaven based upon what they do. That is not salvation. That is a lost person. Salvation is when you give up trusting in what you did. Because what you did got you in this mess. And you realize, it's not me. I need someone to save me. And we needed some help. We needed someone to come save us. And so that's what happened. And they came out and they, they got us and they rescued us. You know what salvation is? Salvation is a rescue. They rescued us. And we actually were rescued. Well, when I got saved on July 29th, 1992, by the way, today is July 29th, my 29th spiritual birthday. Amen. But they came out and they did what they called a rescue. And they rescued us. Salvation is a rescue. God looks down and is in from mercy. He said, you know, mankind can't save themselves. So he came and he died on the cross and he shed every drop of blood. Without shedding blood, no remission of sin. And then he went back up to heaven, put his blood up on the mercy seat there. He says, now if you want to be saved, you come through the blood. Faith in the blood. You trust what I did for you. And I will be the one who delivers you. I will rescue you. I will save you. Do you understand that? Boy, do I understand that. That's a great understanding that I have. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.10. 1 Timothy 4.10. So salvation, it's not an issue of what you do. It's whether or not you've trusted Jesus to rescue you from hell. That's what it all boils down to. A lot of people are trying to rescue themselves, trying to work their way to heaven, and it won't work. You have to give up and say, all right, Lord, I trust you. You're the Savior or Jesus is the Savior. It's one or the other. It can't be both. So you have to choose. Am I going to try to save myself? Well, that didn't work out too good for us. We couldn't. So we looked for help, and we got it. And they rescued us. And we were thankful for that. Well, salvation is going to Jesus and having him rescue you. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.10. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Jesus died on the cross to be the Savior of the whole world. But those who don't accept, they're not saved yet. They're not rescued. It's like they're in a boat that's sinking. And they're sinking down and sinking down and sinking down and sinking down. And they have a choice. They can seek help and trust Jesus to deliver them. Or they can just keep trying to do it themselves. But it won't work out good for them. And guess where they'll end up? They'll end up down there because they chose to try to do it themselves. They had a do-it-yourself salvation. I'm going to save myself. Do you know the Bible teaches that you can't save yourself? You have to come to Jesus. So... Jesus rescued me spiritually, and the other day, I was rescued physically. And what an interesting thing. It was a little nerve-wracking to be on that side of the boat and holding on and, and moving like this and the boat moving, and I'm still sore. I could feel my legs from being like this a lot. And they took us into that boat, and it was just like a sigh of relief. Oh, okay, now we're on the boat. And I remember they took us all the way in, and when we came in, we were like, wow, all this for us? There was. A uh, fire truck, there was police there. I don't remember if there was an ambulance or not, but all these people were there. And we get off the boat, and the first person comes up to us and says, How's it feel to be on dry land and be safe? <laughs> and I thought, Wow, yeah, yeah, finally, there's no more worry. It's, oh man, I'm, I'm rescued, I'm saved, I'm on dry land. I can actually now rest. But uh, after everything was taken care of and they got the boat out, I came home and I rested like a baby. I slept like a baby. 
because someone saved me. And I just want to say publicly thank you to the sheriff's department and the firemen and all those people, the EMS workers and all these people that came out and, and, and rescued us. They're lifesavers. They're, they're doing the work that the Lord is doing. Only you're doing it physically and the Lord's doing it spiritually. And what a great thing that I saw as they came to do their job, to do their duty in rescuing me. They delivered us and, and, and saved us from something that could have happened. And I just want to think about salvation and to think about, wow, that's what Jesus does. When he saves you, he rescues you. And you're rescued from hell. Let's look at a couple of verses here. 2 Corinthians 1.10. Salvation is a deliverance. Okay? It's a one-time event that takes place in your life where you get saved. Do you know when that took place in your life? If you're one of those that's saying, well, I think I'm good enough and I think I uh, deserve heaven because I do this and I do this and I do this. You're trusting in your works. You're not saved yet because it's not what you do that saves you. You cannot rescue yourself. <laughs> you need a savior. You need a deliverer. You need someone to rescue you. 2 Corinthians 1.10 says this. Thank God for salvation because salvation is a rescue from hell. And Jesus Christ rescued me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Who delivered us so, from so great a death, and doth deliver, and whom we trust, that he will yet deliver us. So, like I said, it, it, it didn't seem like that great of a deal because we're just right out there. You can even see the other side. So I knew, worst case scenario, we get swept overboard. Eventually, after a couple hours, we'll probably be, you know, blown into the shore and everything. So I wasn't that scared of dying, but I thought about it later. But there are sharks out there. There are alligators. <laughs> what if we would have died? These people literally saved our lives, saved us from death. They delivered us. Well, Jesus does that too. Go to Colossians chapter 1. So this physical deliverance that we experienced on the boat um, just reminds me of salvation and the spiritual deliverance that we get in Christ. And he saves us. Colossians 1.13 says this, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, speaking of Jesus, those who are saved, and hath translated us into his kingdom, into the kingdom of his dear son. And then 1 Thessalonians 1.10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. So I don't like that we had a boating accident, if you will, and I don't like that things started to, to go bad. If I could do it all over again, I, I wouldn't want to go through this. <laughs> but the fact that we did, wow, how it all ties into what I'm preaching today. I'm just scratching my head going, I wonder if the Lord didn't allow this just so this message could go out and maybe help somebody. Maybe somebody who's one of those lost people who thinks, I've got to do good works to get to heaven. Maybe you realize the Bible teaches that we're saved by faith, not by works. Quit trusting in you and what you do. Don't believe in vain. Trust in what he did, and then he'll deliver you. Then he'll rescue you. Then he'll save you. Then he'll give you rest. I get emails still from people who say, Brother Breaker, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know how to get saved. Please help me. What, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to trust? I want to get saved so bad. I, and they're just like, ah, I can't rest. When you get saved, it's just like, Oh, now I know I'm on my way to heaven. And how do you get saved? It's by believing. It's by faith. First Thessalonians, or yeah, First Thessalonians chapter one, and verse ten. Look what Paul says here. First Thessalonians one ten. First Thessalonians chapter one and verse ten says this: And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So Jesus is the deliverer. He's the Savior. He's the one who will rescue you. And Jesus is there, and he's waiting for you to come to him for salvation because he wants to rescue you. He will deliver you from the wrath to come. And we were out there waiting, and while we're waiting, and the boat's all, all over the place, going down, I'm just thinking to myself, we need somebody to save us. And then it just dawned on me, thank God I have Jesus who saved me. What's the worst that could happen? We die. Well, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going when I die, so, you know, okay. But what a blessing that we were saved and what it felt like to be saved and, and the, them coming and getting us and taking us safely to the harbor and all that just made me think of salvation. And when you get saved, it's just like, whew, now I know. Now I know I'm on my way to heaven. 
Let's go to Luke chapter 17 real quick. So while you're sailing, you, you need a life preserver. So we had on our life preservers, and that helped too. Luke chapter 17 and verse 33. And I'm reading my Bible after all this, and, and it's just, wow, there's, there's so much in the Bible that's nautical. Uh, I thought about starting this sermon with, um, with uh, 1 Timothy 1.19, where Paul talks about shipwreck. That's a nautical term. And as I'm reading my Bible and I'm going through, uh, after going through all this, it's just like, oh, well, that word, oh, man, that's, that's a nautical term. It, and it just, it helps me read my Bible and think about things. Luke 17, 33, after going through something like this. Luke 17, 33, look what it says. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. <laughs> it says life and the word preserve. We put on a life preserver. <laughs> You would call it a flotation device, but we'd always called it a life preserver when I was a kid. And that's to preserve your life. Well, that was interesting. Jesus is my life preserver. And I, I wonder if it wasn't your prayers, too, that helped in this ordeal. But God sure protected us and kept us safe. 2 Timothy 4.18. 2 Timothy 4.18. And what are the odds that when we call 911, the guy who answers like, Oh, Robert Breaker, yeah, I know you. We went to Bible school together. I mean, wow, that's amazing. 2 Timothy 4, 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As we put on the life preserver, our trust was in that. If the boat goes to the bottom and we have to live, we've got a preserver on that's going to keep us afloat. Even if we pass out or whatever, that's preserving our life. That's keeping us saved. What is salvation? You're coming to Jesus Christ. And when you get saved, the Bible says you put on His righteousness. He gives you His imputed righteousness. And He is our preserver. You see, you can't lose salvation after you're saved. It's called eternal life. It's eternal security. Amen? Some of these people out there, they say, I don't believe in eternal security. Well, then you don't know what salvation is. It's a free gift of eternal life. Eternal means for all eternity. How do you lose that? Jesus is my life preserver. He Not only has He saved me, He's keeping me saved. It's like I'm wearing the life preserver and knowing I'll be okay because at least I'm going to float around. Jesus is my life preserver and I know He's going to deliver me at the rapture out of here and take me up to heaven. So Jesus is my life preserver. He's my soul deliverer. He's my heart's trust. And in my mind, I know that He is my Savior. He rescued me. I was looking through the hymn book last night, and I saw some stuff there. And I came across a couple of uh, hymns that I thought were very interesting, that I thought, wow, I need to mention. A lot of Christian people were saved in the past. A lot of them live by the water. I mean, America was founded by pilgrims coming across the water. A lot of nautical terms in the Bible. And here in our hymn book, there's a lot of hymns about things like this. And so going through an experience like this really opened up not only the Bible to me even more, but the hymn book even more. One of these hymns is called, My Anchor Holds. And though the angry surges roll on my tempest-driven soul, I am peaceful for I know, wildly though the winds may blow, I have an anchor safe and sure that will evermore endure, for it holds, my anchor holds. That's amazing, isn't it, to think about as the boat was on its side, and I, I'll probably put some pictures in here for you to see and stuff like that, but the boat was on its side, these guys jumped on and took the anchor and threw it out. And that's what saved the boat and left it in that place for them to come out and salvage it the day later. But there's a couple of uh, hymns here that are quite interesting, and one of them is, is Haven of Rest. I'm going to sing this to you real quick. And see if you don't identify with this. If you're saved, you know what I'm talking about today. And you know what it is to be saved. To be saved is to know you're on your way to heaven and to know that you didn't save yourself. You see, someone that's saved doesn't go around bragging saying, I'm getting to heaven because I did this. That's a person that's not saved. Someone saved is someone that says, you know, I, I knew I couldn't get to heaven on my own. That's why I trusted Jesus and he saved me. So what a blessing. So haven of rest. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress. 
Till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus I'm safe evermore. I yielded myself to his tender embrace, and faith taking hold of the word. My fetters fell off, and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. It's a song all about how you're in the sea and tossed about and everything's going wrong. But the one that saves you is Jesus. Just like those people came out, the rescue workers saved me in the water. The song of my soul since the Lord made me whole Has been the old story so blessed Of Jesus who'll save whosoever will have A home in the haven of rest I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. I mean, it's all there. You got to know something to be saved. You got to trust. You got to believe. It's with all your heart. And when you're saved, Jesus saves your soul. Last verse. Oh, come to the Savior. He patiently waits to save by his power divine. Come anchor your soul in the haven of rest. And say, my beloved is mine. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Amen. So I wanted to get that out there. And I wanted to make sure that you know that you're saved. I really believe that the rapture is coming very, very soon. And uh, what an eye-opening thing that will be when the rapture comes. And how many people will be left behind. Those left behind are those that didn't trust Jesus to save them that didn't trust in Him for rescue, that didn't anchor their souls in Christ. No, they were still working, trying to get to heaven based upon their works. Now, after we're saved, we work. But we don't work to get saved or stay saved. Works are after you're saved. If you're trusting in your works, it's like you're bailing out a boat that's sinking. (laughs) And it's sinking faster than you bailing it out. You have to have someone save you because you can't save yourself. Well, what happens next, Brother Breaker? So many questions right now. I guess we're just waiting for the insurance guy to to tell us what's going to happen next. And that was something I didn't even think about. We, We took out some insurance on the boat, but I was just so happy to be 
saved and rescued that I didn't even think about that. And that was one of the things they said, well, now you need to call your insurance. You need to call, oh, more hassle. I thought to myself, all this stuff. But thinking about insurance, did you know that insurance used to be called assurance? I uh, remember when I went to Houston to look up my old family history and things like that. Back in the 1900s and 1800s, it wasn't called insurance. It was called assurance. And I'd see all these ads in old newspapers for an assurance company. And we went to different places and I, there's still buildings where you can go. Such and such assurance company. I don't know when they changed the name from assurance to insurance, but today they call it insurance. But in the old days, it was called assurance, assurance company. Why? Because you pay them your money and you're assured that they will pay back if something happens. It's an assurance. And just thinking about that made me think even more about salvation. When you're saved, guess what you have? You have assurance of salvation. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, you know. So salvation, this whole disaster, for lack of a better word, just made me rely more on the Lord and think more about Jesus. And uh, I had the knowledge of sailing. We had a good time sailing. Um, I did anyway. But just knowing isn't enough. You have to trust. You have to believe. Sometimes you can know just enough to get yourself in a mess. Salvation isn't just knowing it. Salvation is when you realize, I can do nothing more. I've done everything I could, and it wasn't ever enough. I need a Savior. I need someone to rescue me, and I'm going to trust in them. And we were rescued, and we were taken to our haven of rest, and we got off the boat, and they checked us out, made sure we were okay. I'm glad we're saved, and I appreciate those rescue workers who saved us. But it made me think, the whole thing made me think about being saved and salvation. And I just want to ask, are you saved? Are you trusting in the blood of Jesus? Weirdest thing, when we get out of the boat, they're waiting for us to come in, and uh, they're thinking, are they hurt? Do we need to take them to the hospital? And I don't know what was on the side of that boat that the rescue worker had, but there was a bunch of red there. And the guy comes running up. He said, are you okay? And he looks down, he says, is that blood? <laughs> and the guy goes, no, no, that's just red ink from something we had rubbing up against the boat. But I was just like, wow. Here I'm just, I'm dazed, I'm confused. I just got rescued and I'm starting to think, wow, this is like Jesus that rescued me. And then they mentioned the blood. <laughs> I don't want to forget the blood when it comes to salvation. So no, it wasn't blood, but that's the first question the guy asked. Is that blood? <laughs> no, there was some red stuff. But when it comes to salvation, that's the first question I have for you. Are you trusting in the blood? Have you allowed someone to save you? That someone is Jesus, and he wants to rescue you. Are you out trying to rescue yourself? Are you out trying to work your way to heaven? You need to give up and say, Lord, I can't save myself. And then trust in what he did. Trust his blood for salvation. Well, there's my message this week. I hope it's a blessing to you. I, like I said, I'm embarrassed to talk about what we went through. But the Lord, I guess, put us through this. And my hope is that the devil won't win. Amen. Sometimes I wonder if the devil doesn't do this kind of stuff. But the Bible says if you take it patiently and wait. Romans, uh, you know. Uh, 828 or is it that all things work together for good for them who love God and who are the called according to his purpose God can always take a disaster and turn it into good and you know what I'd love to hear I'd love to hear somebody email and say brother breaker thank you for this message right here you helped me understand salvation I was trusting in what I did I just gave up and now I trust in Jesus what a great thing to hear that somebody got saved through all this that'd make it all worthwhile but y'all, would you please pray for us? Keep us in prayer. The devil's attacking because he doesn't want people preaching the gospel. And he's uh, probably going after us, but I trust the Lord. And I'm going to continue trusting in Jesus to keep me safe. Amen. I know I'm saved and my soul is in the haven of rest. My soul is saved. It's this body that's the problem. And they saved my body that day. And I thank God for that. Now I'm waiting for the rescue of the rapture when Jesus comes and takes me out. My wife said, honey, you did really good. You didn't complain. You didn't get upset. You were like a rock. You were just, you knew what to do. You were there. You were trying the best to, to get everything. She said, I'm just, I was so surprised how calm you were. And I said, well, I guess I put on a good show outwardly. Amen. 
But when you're saved, what's the worst that can happen? Oh no, I die and go to heaven, you know? Salvation is just where it's at. That's the most important thing is salvation. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. So thank you, all you rescue workers and firemen and, and EMS and, and FWC, Florida Wildlife Conservation Sheriff's Office, all you people that were there that saved us and helped us. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me on July 29th, 1992, the day I got saved. There's the message. I hope it's been a blessing to you. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. God bless. Bye-bye.